Nuna Alikian, and I welcome all of you at the Future Studio discussion platform. This webinar is being translated via Zoom into Armenian, Russian, and French languages. This is Artsakh. The war has been raging for almost a month, five days short of a month, and it is very difficult to comprehend that Artsakh and Armenia, in fact, has been at war for almost a month now. We've been overwhelmed by daily news, and today we have a unique opportunity to look into the context of what's been happening um, and uh, to try to understand the processes that underline the reality that we've been living through. Um, there is no easy answers. Um, and it is my privilege and honor to introduce Professor George Derlugian, um, who's kindly um, agreed to join us today. Professor Derlugian, hello. Hi, good evening. Uh, professor Derlugian is a professor of sociology and public policy at New York uh, University in Abu Dhabi. Um, there's been a question from the audience why Professor Delugan is not in Armenia. In fact, Professor Delugan and his wonderful wife are in Armenia and has been in Armenia for a long time now. And I understand will remain in Armenia for at least a year now. Um, prior uh, to uh, moving to Yerevan and uh, holding this cur his current post uh, with New York University in Abu Dhabi, Professor Delugan uh, has been teaching at uh, Michigan University and Northwestern University. So it is my honor and thank you for being with us today. Um, I wish I could call Professor my friend, but in fact, um, maybe someday. Um, to me, he is more a teacher with a capital T and a mentor. He's been our one of the most fierce critics of the work that Ruben Vardanian and I did. And I am eternally grateful for that. Um, he introduced personally to some amazing teachings of his teacher, um, Emmanuel Wallenstein, uh, and his works, and I recommend any of you to read it and understand it. So uh, if you do have a desire to listen to what Professor Deligan has to say twice, you're welcome to do so, because the I believe that there is so much to comprehend within an hour that um, I probably will listen twice after we finish in order to understand what Professor has to share with us. I do apologize for any possible loss of connections because we are in this kind of uh, virtual reality, but stay with us and we will connect and try to reconnect um, again. So today Arsakh is on our mind and uh, Professor, the floor is yours. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. Um, we received questions in advance, and the questions show that part of the audience are new to the topic, and I will try to cover and to answer the questions, and other part of the audience are uh, very much inside the topic, so they posted very sophisticated questions. I will also try to address those. It's quite a challenge. It's a great audience. I only wish, you know, that teaching online, I had such an audience and such a connection. So let me begin from the end. How could this war end? I'm going to introduce a way of reasoning about it because it's very necessary now. People are very emotional, understandably. Uh, people spend a lot of time in the internet, I would argue that too much, that it's probably the time to get out into reality, at least for many. Uh, people are asking, how will it end, when it will end? Let me try to suggest, you know, that there are really just two opportunities to end it. One opportunity, one possibility where it will stabilize uh, would be a disaster for the Armenian side, uh, but it's possible you know, that Armenian armies, uh, the volunteers in Karabakh will be destroyed or defeated because they are facing um, much larger attackers 
who are supported by uh, the second largest army in the NATO alliance, uh, who wield uh, sophisticated 21st century weapons. Uh, it is quite possible, you know, that the defenses might collapse. If they do, the result would be ethnic cleansing. Uh, the present regime in Azerbaijan, and I will explain soon what is the regime, will regain control over the entire territory. And it is extremely unlikely, I fail to see, how they would ever even welcome any Armenians in that territory or anywhere in Azerbaijan. Uh, immediately, let me pass to a joke. It's not a joke, actually, it's a real story. My co-author, Sufyan Zhemukhov, a few years ago was invited to a conference in Baku. He is a Cherkassian ethnically. He carries a Russian passport. Uh, he was detained uh, upon landing in Azerbaijan. His passport was taken and you know, he had to wait a couple hours. Why I can uh, relate this story? Because it was described in writing by Sufyan himself on several websites. Uh, it turned out it was a misunderstanding uh, that after questioning him thoroughly, the Azerbaijani uh, border guard official or security official finally asked him, you know, so are you Armenian? Because his first name ended in Yan, like so many Armenian names, like my last name, Derlud Yan. Uh, it's just the uh, genitive case uh, in Armenian, it means son of. However, Sufyan is the first name, and it's a Muslim first name. Abu Sufyan was the senior elder of Mecca in the times of the prophet. Amazingly enough, nobody on the Azerbaijani side recognized that. They apologized, they let him in. And while apologizing, they said, you know, we even tried to stop Armani suits coming in here. Armenians are not welcome because we cannot guarantee their security while in Azerbaijan. This is actually an official line. Even the people of Armenian origin who carry Russian passports cannot travel to Azerbaijan because the government, the authorities, uh, refuse to give them personal guarantee of safety. Tells you something. The result would be, however, that Azerbaijan, I'm not quite sure, would be able to control its own territory ever since. Uh, I was skeptical at first about the stories of uh, militants, or let's face it, terrorists, coming from the Middle East. Why? They are not really very sophisticated fighters. Uh, why would they have ever speak to journalists? You know, the first were the journalists to report the presence of jihadis from Syria. However, then we received uh, confirmations from France, the Russian Foreign Intelligence Service, and now it seems to be a widely recognized fact. Um, Russian newspapers, alluding to their military diplomatic sources, published even the names, you know, the types of flights that they were taking. So it, this is probably a fact. So why the jihadis are in Azerbaijan? We can only guess, like in many instances about this war, we have to guess what is the uh, plan of the operation from how the operation is developing. So it looks like, you know, the people from Syria, the fighters from Syria uh, might be handy, not only as cheap, expendable cannon fodder, but also as uh, street fighters who have uh, the experience from places like Aleppo. So we might expect yet to watch how Stepanakert and other towns of uh, mountainous Karabakh, just they're still much smaller than Aleppo, but they may, might become something like Aleppo. So these fighters would be ne needed, you know, for uh, street fighting, house to house fighting, but also for ethnic cleansing, you know, because their reputation precludes that anybody would even contemplate staying on the site, you know, with the conquerors. How do you get them out? That's the question. So in the Southern Caucasus, you would get another group of jihadis, 
how would anyone in the West look at this? How would the Russians look at this? That remains a big question. Even Iran, remember, you know, the Iranian forces have been fighting against the same jihadis in Syria. Uh, there is another possibility. And this is probably more realistic and more welcome possibility that uh, there will be an international protectorate uh, declared over the territory, in at least part of territory of mountainous Karabakh, a no-flight zone. And that would require international joint effort. That's why it is more problematic. However, I think that's where it is going. And that's why the fighting continues. Now, I promised that I will try to reason and teach how to reason about such wars. So let me say from the beginning two things about myself. I am not a military or diplomatic expert. I have no secret intelligence information. All I know, all the details you know, are coming from open sources, which I try to compare. And this is the second thing about it. I teach actually a class for a long time. I've been teaching a class in sociology called the analysis of global news. Uh, informally, students call it reading between the lines course. So what can you reconstruct from reading the sources, the very contradictory sources, which claim very different things? For instance, when Armenian side report that there are static, there is static fighting going on, Apparently, they have no big advances to report, you know, so they are on the defensive. They have been on the defensive from day one, from the first hour. On the other hand, when Azerbaijani sources claim, you know, that they score big victories, you try to look at the map and see, you know, do they really score those big victories and how big they are and where exactly are they? And here we will need to come uh, to an analysis of what are the structures, the political structures and the historical structures on both sides. First, let me go into just a little bit of history because if you are new to this topic, you will be hearing all over again that this goes back centuries. Well, not quite so. In fact, the Armenian nation is quite interesting, you know, because uh, for anthropologists, uh, because uh, it was formed in late antiquity. There are several such examples dating back to late Roman Empire. Uh, as you probably know, Greeks, of course, were there already, long there. You know, Greeks were formed and their identity and their language you know, have been continuous uh, for more than 3000 years. There were Celts. We often forget about Celts or uh, what you know, the nations which survive today is the Irish and Scots. There were Jews, of course, you know, quite many Jews. You know, uh, in the time of uh, the birth of Christianity, almost 10% of Roman Empire population are estimated to be Jewish. There were Persians, they were not in the, uh, in the empire, they were opponents of empire. They're still very much around. And there were, if you wish to mention also the uh, Coptic Egyptians, direct descendants of ancient Egyptians who became Christian in late Roman times and stay Christian. This is the Christian minority in Egypt. Uh, the direct descendants, uh, not of invading Arabs in medieval times, but of the original ancient Egyptian population. Uh, these are the ethnic groups which survived uh, through the floods of medieval period. Uh, the Roman Empire had collapsed and many different uh, groups of populations you know, invaded uh, this very rich, once very rich area. So we know, of course, the Germanic tribes uh, in the West, uh, Visigoths, Ostrogoths, uh, Anglo-Saxons eventually. We know about the Slavs who would populate large areas of the Balkans, for instance, producing today the peoples like Serbians, Croatians, Bulgarians. Uh, there would be um, people coming from Arabian deserts, 
That's how we have mostly the Arab speaking Middle East. And there would be the Turkic tribesmen coming from Central Asia. They all changed, they mixed with local populations. Uh, if you look at the original Turkic um, ethnic groups in Siberia, they are Mongoloid, you know, they, they look very Asian. If you look at the Turks or even Azerbaijanis today, they are probably pretty much anthropologically as the kind of populations you know, that had existed there before. So probably they changed their language, they changed their culture. Uh, but there is no reason you know, to say that Azerbaijanis are not a historical nation. You know, they have been around for at least 700 years. There is a literature. It's a very, it's a non-consolidated until recently non-consolidated nation, you know, but there are many speakers of different dialects of what becomes Azeri. And uh, they have been mostly within the confines of Persian empire. That is actually important, you know, because the religion historically was Shia Islam, like in Iran, not Sunni Islam, like in Turkey, like in Ottoman Empire or in the Arab world. The kitchen, many Moors, you know, many traditions you know, were from there. Uh, I think this is more than enough uh, as introductions for now. Uh, so we have a very old population reduced to being minority within their countries because of the migration in medieval times and migra medieval migrations, as you realize, are associated with invasions, nomadic invasions on horseback, but also assimilating people into um, new dominant cultures and languages. That's more than enough. I know. The, really, the, uh, the conflict goes back to the late 19th century, a bit more than 100 years ago. And it is related to oil, believe it or not. Because Baku, which becomes later the capital of Azerbaijan, was uh, a place where oil was always coming to the surface. It was known for centuries there. But only in the 1880s, it becomes a commercial commodity. And it becomes very important commercial commodity because people turn to new source of light, kerosene, much better and cheaper than uh, candles used to be, for instance. And the people who managed to profit from the early oil exploration made fabulous fortunes. So in the United States, that would be John D. Rockefeller and Standard Oil, the famous or infamous monopoly. In Baku, which was at the time, we're talking about around 1900, the second largest source of oil exports in the world. It was almost the ha half, this is before Middle Eastern oil. Uh, almost half of oil was coming from Baku at the time. And it was associated with such famous families as the Nobel brothers from Sweden who worked in the Russian empire. Yes, these are the brothers of the Nobel prize. Um, Alfred Nobel you know, was, um, somebody, I think cousin, you know, in their family. They were the Rothschilds or the Rothschilds as we pronounce in English. Uh, the Rothschilds in, uh, invested in Baku. It became a hub of very important innovation. For instance, the first oil tanker ever in the world was launched by the Nobel brothers in Baku, Zoroaster was, was, its, was its name. The first pipeline was built from Baku to Batumi. Why? Because Baku still today is landlocked and so it needed uh, an expert outlet, and that outlet was Batumi. Now, would you be surprised that a young Georgian socialist, an underground agitator called Josef Josef Jugashvili, later known as Stalin, began his career organizing strikes of the oil workers in Batumi first, and later in Baku. So most of the career. Um, revolutionary career of Stalin before um, World War I was spent between uh, the oil hub, the oil port in Batumi and the oil city of uh, Baku. Oil and all this development attracted a lot of people. Among them were many Armenians. Why? Because they were more, more mobile, uh, because they lost out in the medieval times in uh, terms of uh, land occupation. Uh, the, the difference was quite simple, you know, that uh, the people who came from the steppe uh, of Eurasia on horseback, 
the nomadic people. They were mostly interested in pasturage, which they claimed. You know, this is mostly in the plains. If there is mountainous Karabakh, you might suspect that there is lowland Karabakh. Yes, that's where some fighting now is going on because it's easier to advance tank armies there along the border with Iran. Uh, the population of lowlands were mostly nomadic people or semi-nomadic, well, or let's say pastoralists. You know, so they had herds of animals. Uh, the Christians had to go into the mountains uh, because it was more protected area, but less fertile. And that's why the people from the mountains always go uh, seeking jobs elsewhere uh, as migrant laborers. So they were earlier coming to Baku. Some est established themselves as uh, managers in the new industry, make beautiful careers. Quite a few of the rich oil men in Baku were ethnic Armenians at the time. There were a few ethnic Iranians or Persians. There were Georgians, as you, you heard, you know, there were Swedes. Uh, but Armenians made uh, a significant proportion of middle class is this in this new uh, uh, urban and modern environment. Uh, the local Muslim population was not backward, uh, or I want to, you know, to uh, warn against these stereotypes, you know, lazy. No, uh, it just, you know, they had uh, more to sacrifice, you know, because they had their living in fairly comfortable villages elsewhere so they would be late you know but eventually they would come and they would realize you know that they were being minority they, they might be uh, not the most important uh, segment in this new economy all this exploded first in the russian revolution of 1905 uh, imagine it, it's very simple uh, typical um, daily life situation you know that somebody looks at an armenian lawyer or a uh, successful businessman and remembers that you know the grandfather of this guy was a servant to my grandfather. So what is going on? Uh, where is the justice, historical justice here? And we are majority uh, in the villages, at least around here. So first, this explodes in um, massacres uh, around 1905, the Russian Revolution. Why? Because there was a breakdown of order. Uh, the empire lost, Russian Empire lost its war against Japan. Uh, most of the troops were there. Russian workers began rebelling in the heartland of Russia. In Baku, there were also very violent strikes, big fires set to the oil complex. Uh, this was barely suppressed, but then came the Second War uh, in 1914, in another war. And that war disrupted even more. And as you know, it resulted in the Bolshevik Revolution, during which, uh, Azerbaijan, Georgia, and Armenia found themselves temporarily cut off from the main Russian empire. The empire had collapsed and there was civil war between the Reds, the Bolsheviks, and the Whites going on. During this time, three independent states emerged essentially amidst the ruins of World War I. Uh, Georgia probably uh, less destroyed, uh, Armenia very much destroyed, you know, because it was tiny, you know, the kind of Armenia that emerged is only a small chunk of the historical Armenian lands. But as you probably know, uh, Ottoman government or Turkish government in uh, during the uh, fighting of World War I was suffering defeats and they conveniently blamed it on the Christian populations close to the borderlands. So could it be that, of course, you know, the standard explanation that Turkish army was stepped in the back by Armenians. So Armenians were in 1915 were ordered deported to the uh, deserts of Syria. And apparently there was also a second secret order that if these people don't reach the destination ever, nobody would mind in the government. Uh, so we are not quite sure how many died because nobody was keeping record. But the fact is that before 1914, probably two or two and a half million people in Eastern Anatolia in what later becomes Turkey were Armenians. After the war, there were barely 50,000 left. So what happened to majority of them? They were either killed or they were dispersed as refugees across the Arab lands, later traveling all the way to the United States, France, to Russia. This is the story of 
my Armenian ancestors. I am not fully Armenian, but my grandfather, this is how he ended up in Russia. Uh, and a few of these refugees made to the area around Yerevan. This is where the Republic of Armenia was proclaimed. Uh, the Republic of Azerbaijan was proclaimed around uh, first what today is Ganja, uh, the second important city in Azerbaijan, because in Baku there were still too many Armenians and they were supporting the Bolshevik government there, which was called the Baku Commune. Baku Commune fell after several months and it was very violent fall. Uh, the Republic of Azerbaijan, Democratic Republic of Azerbaijan, was something quite important, by the way. It was the first ever modern republic in the Muslim world. By the way, oh, sorry. It was also a very important uh, cultural center because um, you know this oil allowed to expand vastly uh, the educational opportunity and cultural opportunity. For instance, the first ever comic opera in the Muslim world, Arshin Malalan, was first performed in 1912 in Baku, uh, written by Uzir Gajibekov. I very much recommend you if you can find it online. Uh, it's a remarkable achievement. And today, hard to believe, the first ever caricatures, cartoons, uh, depicting in satirical light, uh, Islamic religion, clergy, and maybe the prophet Muhammad himself, were actually published by Azerbaijani um, enlighteners. There was a comical journal called Mullah Nasreddin. Uh, it was more than 100 years ago. So what causes such huge violent controversies now in France was actually the achievement of Democratic Republic of Azerbaijan back then. But then a terrible thing happened. First, it was Germany, of course, winning uh, World War I, but Germany itself lost it and Turkish Empire collapsed in November 1918, World War I ended. And then the British arrived. During this period, three republics, Georgia, Armenia, Azerbaijan, pleaded recognition from European powers gathering in Versailles. Remember the Versailles Treaty, which ends the uh, First World War? Uh, the Versailles, Versailles Treaty gave 12 months. You know, so basically, you know, it's a uh, typical trick of experienced politicians. Okay, you want our recognition? You have 12 months during which you have to meet three kinds of um, important requirements. First, you must claim your historical rights to this area. And of course, you, you can imagine historians in Armenia, Azerbaijan, and Georgia immediately become very busy discovering historical documents, maps uh, to support their claims to what was there before. Of course, for Armenians, you know, they would be uh, favoring late antiquity when Armenia was great. Uh, Azeri uh, scholars would be uh, favoring uh, later medieval periods when uh, they were Hanates of future Azerbaijan, Georgians somewhere in between, uh, the periods in between Queen Tamar and so forth. Second and third clauses were more disruptive. The second clause claimed you know, that the uh, three independent republics must prove uh, the belonging of territories by flying their flag over them. So if you have a garrison somewhere, you know, it might be your territory. So you, in the language of the time, it was called the right of effective occupation. And then there was the third clause for the contested territories, something like Karabakh or Zangezur, uh, areas between Armenia, uh, what today is Armenia and Azerbaijan. So if the population is mostly Armenian, but it is claimed by Azerbaijan, we are going to promise uh, a plebiscite, as they called it uh, 100 years ago, or referendum. Guess what was the reasoning for uh, European powers to give 12 months? In 1919, they expected that the whites of General Anton Denikin would win the civil war in Russia. And that would be the end of these three ephemeral states in Transcaucasia. They would be reconquered by the Russian whites. Um, and the problem would be gone. Uh, probably this was on their mind, you know, let's see if you survive. Uh, what was the reasoning for the three 
national governments on the ground, try to send your troops to all the contested areas and try to make sure that the populations who might vote in a future plebiscite not in your favor are out of here. This produced a wave of ethnic cleansing everywhere. Uh, in the event, however, not the whites, but the reds, the Bolsheviks won, and they arrived in force. Uh, the communists came in force in 1920 into the area of first Azerbaijan, then they occupied Armenia, and finally in 1921, Georgia. And they faced a problem. Okay, so there are these contested areas. So Azerbaijan claims that Karabakh belongs to it. You know, the population is majority, almost 90% Armenian. What are we going to do? The first uh, move, and actually it's documented, you know, by Stalin himself, was to transfer Armenian populated area to Armenia. But then there were second thoughts. And that was again about oil. Because Batumi is located in a predominantly Muslim part of Georgia. They speak Georgian language there, Gurian dialect mostly, but this population had converted during the centuries of Ottoman rule to Sunni Islam. So if they were allowed a right of choice back in 1921-22, they probably would have joined Turkey. This would remove uh, the important oil exporting port of Batumi from the Soviet sphere of influence, which was not quite acceptable to them. And so they came with a different plan. So all ethnic hatreds are the result of uh, backwardness. So since Baku is such a big hub of industry, let's attach uh, mountainous Karabakh to Soviet Azerbaijan now, and it will be all right in a, in a few years, it will be developed and they will forget probably about these wild rivalries. By the way, this is exactly the reasoning behind European Union offering recognition or withdrawing it from the former Yugoslav republics. Okay, if Slovenia or Croatia behaved themselves, we will get them into the European Union. Kosovo, possibly, you know, but if you prove that you can behave in a civilized manner. The hope is that after several years, passions would cool down that economic development would trump uh, the uh, ethnic allegiances and those members. Uh, the Soviets uh, supported their claim with a lot of violence, as you know, that the people who disagreed might be actually deported to Siberia or simply shot as bourgeois nationalists. This was the situation under the rule of Stalin in the 1930s and 40s. Uh, later, the Soviet Union becomes uh, more uh, stable, uh, stable, much less violent, you know, the blessed decades of Brezhnev's rule, oil is flowing, you know, being exported, you know, the Soviet Union was somewhat more prosperous, however, the tensions always remained, and it looked very strange, actually, on the map. Here is Republic of Armenia, and just next to it, within a few miles away, there is a majority Armenian populated Armenian autonomous uh, province, of mountainous Karabakh attached to Azerbaijan or within Azerbaijan. Why is that? So this uh, is what exploded in 1988, you know, with uh, Mikhail Gorbachev mandating his perestroika, his reforms and democratization. Uh, the population in uh, Karabakh, I describe this in my book, Bourdieu's secret admirer in the Caucasus. Um, if it comes to that, you know, you can consult. You know, so what I wrote at, at greater length and more analytically as a sociologist about what I understand could be reconstructed there. Um, it almost immediately turned into a disaster because there were almost 200,000 ethnic Azeris still uh, living in many villages around Armenia. Why? You know, because if you look at the ethnic map of late 19th century, it looks like a leopard skin. You know, there are here in you know, Armenian area, uh, Muslim area, not necessarily Azerbaijani. They would become Azerbaijani later. Uh, they could be Kurdish. You know, they, there are many. It's fascinating anthropologically. You know, there are uh, groups uh, which speak uh, medieval dialects of Persian language. You know, there are other groups which have their own dialects and uh, their own languages, which are unrelated to anything else in the world, so-called isolates. But they were Muslim, 
Uh, and on this ground, eventually, you know, they drifted into considering themselves Azerbaijani. You know, so when the South Caucasus uh, Muslims became generally known as Azerbaijanis. Uh, so there were about 200,000 of them in the Soviet Republic of Armenia. And they began fleeing their homes because they no longer felt, they never felt you know, quite welcome in Soviet Armenia. And very soon Armenia becomes a mono-ethnic republic. But there were also 400,000, you know, twice as many ethnic Armenians still living in Baku, in Kiravabad, which later would be called Ganja. And these were mostly urban populations, middle-class specialists, uh, medical doctors, uh, engineers, as I described uh, earlier. These were quite well-established people. And Baku used to be a fascinating hub of multi-ethnic interaction. It boasted, for instance, one of the most important jazz festivals in the Soviet Union, actually in the whole Eastern Bloc in the 1950s and 60s. Uh, there were very important intellectuals emerging there, but now it was a disaster. So rural people, very angry, losing their homes, are coming to Azerbaijan. And they began claiming homes where these comfortable Armenians were ensconced. And in industrial city of Sumgait, this almost immediately resulted in a ghastly massacre. Dozens of Armenians were killed. And this was like a call to all Armenian nation. We are back to genocide times. You know, so from there on, uh, we can discuss, you know, was it possible at all you know, to stop had Mikhail Gorbachev used more power and more force at the time, but it didn't because it was a peripheral issue for Moscow at the time. It looked like a peripheral issue because, hey, okay, it's very unpleasant, it's nasty. However, there is nuclear arms negotiations going on with the United States. There is economic reform being launched within the Soviet Union, democratization. We need to figure out what is happening in Poland. You know, there were very important issues facing Moscow. So they tried just to isolate you know, what was going on in the South Caucasus, however, once violence is committed on a uh, mass scale and it goes unpunished, violence enters the uh, repertoire of political action. Then you know that actually you can get away with uh, staging violent demonstrations, so actually massacring whole populations. There are mysterious uh, occurrences say, in, in Central Asia and Uzbekistan, Meshetian and Turks were massacred. And that effectively ended any interference from Moscow. So Moscow found itself losing control of one republic after another. In Armenia, a local volunteer force began emerging, guerrillas essentially, to protect fellow Armenians in Karabakh. And by summer 1990, I witnessed it already. You know, I came back to Moscow and said, you know, the Soviet Union is doomed. I witnessed almost real war between two former Soviet republics. Many people at the time thought that I was exaggerating. However, within just a couple of years, a superpower was doomed. It collapsed in 1991 because one after another, republics began withdrawing, including Azerbaijan. And when Azerbaijan withdrew from Soviet Union, what about the autonomous uh, Nagorno-Karabakh or mountainous Karabakh uh, province? They voted to stay with Armenia. So if you are leaving the Soviet Union, we stay with Armenia. In this case, this produced a war, as you probably uh, now realize. And in this war, Armenians were better organized and better motivated simply because they were desperate. They felt very much like today, cornered, that they could not afford to lose uh, this war. And the result was spectacular, that Armenians started as underdog. They were less armed, there were fewer in numbers, but in the course of the following two years, 1992, 93, they prevailed and the, by the beginning of 94, they actually captured several more, seven I think districts, uh, which were mostly uh, Azerbaijani around uh, mountainous Karabakh, not inside Karabakh itself, because they were trying to create a buffer zone around mountainous Karabakh. Karabakh is, uh, you might be, those who are, who are unfamiliar, you know, might be confused. What is Artsakh? What is Karabakh? Artsakh is uh, a mid early medieval uh, name. It 
goes back to, you know, to the 6th, 6th, 7th century AD. Artsakh uh, sounds you know, like anything ancient, you know, sounds more noble. Karabakh is uh, part Turkish. Kara means black or dark. Bakh is Persian, uh, meaning um, garden or forest, you know, because the mountains uh, of mountainous Karabakh are very densely forested, you know, so they look from afar, they look dark against the background of uh, yellow steppe and desert around. So uh, mountainous Karabakh uh, became Armenian and the districts around it were uh, attached as a buffer zone. At that time, now I have to explain you know, who is in power. In Azerbaijan to this day, the same family rules that came to power, they are still in Soviet times in 1969. In 1969, middle age and relatively young KGB or state security, uh, Soviet state security general Heydar Aliyev was appointed the first secretary of the Republic. Why? Because it was considered so corrupt in Moscow that they wanted drastic measures somebody coming from a uh, spy agency. We actually don't know for this reason, we actually don't know almost anything about the prior career of Heydar Aliyev, uh, which was probably quite interesting. You know, what was he doing in the 1940s? What was he doing in the 1950s, even early 60s? Uh, there are only speculation, you know, fascinating personality. He was very powerful personality, you know, cold blooded, but at the same time, full of energy, ruthless, kind of real tough oriental leader. Many people called him Dragon. In 1987, Gorbachev removed him from power and sent him into retirement. But during the war in Karabakh, when Azerbaijan was in semi-collapse and it was uh, almost failed state, he came back as the savior of the country, established himself in a very uh, ruthless manner, and uh, he ended the experiment with democratization in Azerbaijan. It was now authoritarian rule for the sake of uh, stability and continuity. I'm citing the official Azerbaijani line. And when Heydar Aliyev was growing old in the early 2000s, he left power to his son, Ilham, who is president of Azerbaijan now. So essentially it's a dynasty in a petro state. At the same time, uh, Western companies, primarily British Petroleum, uh, began penetrating uh, Azerbaijan, hoping to get um, an unexplored or post-Soviet you know, uh, chunk of oil and gas you know, from the Caspian, exporting it through Georgia and Turkey, uh, kind of the usual you know, geopolitics of big um, oil companies. This created probably the incentive why, so we, we blame lots of things on oil companies and there are reasons, you know, this was the incentive not to settle uh, about the status of mountainous Karabakh because Armenians in the beginning proclaimed, you know, that they were ready to give back to Azerbaijan. Of course, you know, these were not Armenian populated districts. Uh, if Azerbaijan recognized uh, mountainous Karabakh and its attachment to Armenia. Uh, many negotiations were conducted. We don't know, we're not privy to those negotiations, you know, so we can only guess, you know, what was being discussed, but negotiations invariably broke down and probably um, from Azerbaijani side, but also from Armenian side, because in Armenia, there are quite a few nationalists who uh, began claiming, you know, that we are not going to give back, you know, even an inch of land. But in Azerbaijan, there were even more. So any ruler of Azerbaijan, and you have an authoritarian ruler there, would lose power, would probably would not survive, you know, if he come from, at least, you know, they thought so, especially Ilham, because his father, if you remember, was nicknamed Dragon. His son was a young prince of Padishah, you know, he grew up in luxury. Well, I knew him, you know, because he was my classmate in Moscow in late 1970s. Um, he lived in luxury and he had to be very savvy politically you know, because there were many children of minions of his father, but there were also children of the enemies of his father studying in Moscow, you know, kind of emigre politics. Uh, and I'm quite sure that uh, the main consideration behind this war 
is domestic politics of Azerbaijan. Uh, Azerbaijan uh, or Ilham Aliyev, its ruler, faced a dilemma. If he attacks Armenians and their very well entrenched lines in um, Karabakh and around it, uh, and if he loses the war, he loses power. If he wins the war, however, you know, this produces probably uh, national heroes and no authoritarian regime can actually tolerate big national heroes, you know, because the hero must be the Padishah, you know, the ruler himself. Uh, besides, you know, the, it, it was very risky, you know, because uh, probably a risky proposition because probably Azerbaijan could not prevail. You know, they tested Armenian defenses on several occasions, sometimes quite strongly, were repulsed, and it looked like a deadlock. And suddenly, September this year, the deadlock was broken because Turkey came to the rescue of Azerbaijan. Turkey, uh, or President Erdogan, who is playing very bold gambler's game on many different desks at the same time, in Syria, against uh, Cyprus and Greece, in Libya, a failed state, you know, which is torn by internal strife. Uh, he made uh, proclamations on behalf of uh, Pakistan in the fight over Kashmir with, with India. Uh, he harbored uh, fighters from Chinese uh, Muslim province, you know, the Uyghurs, ethnic Uyghurs as, as fellow Turks. Uh, and he made proclamations even about the belonging of Jerusalem, that it was for 400 years, in fact, uh, an Ottoman city. The Turks left it in the end of World War I in tears. Uh, many different things, you know. So uh, Erdogan is a fascinating uh, politician. I cannot spend much time here, you know, but remember, you know, he has been in power for almost 20 years. The first 10 years in power, he looked like a reformer, even democratizer, a liberal Islamist, who was hoping to bring Turkish Republic into European Union. That failed for many complex reasons on the EU side, but also in Turkey. And then uh, Tayyip Erdogan faced a challenge domestically. The challenge came in 2013 from the left, so-called Gezi Park rebellion in Istanbul. You can look this up. And then in 2016, it was the challenge, quite obscure, and you know, we're not quite sure what happened, but there was a military coup attempt in Turkey. Coup attempt, which almost succeeded. Turkish combat airplanes bombed government buildings in Ankara. Uh, reportedly, Erdogan himself barely survived by chance you know, uh, in this coup, but he prevailed. And after this, he changes his attitude very radically, and now, He's playing the gambits. Uh, I'm not claiming that he's Hitler, you know, but it's very much like Adolf Hitler in the mid 1930s or Mussolini. What could you do? Hey, you know, here I go and invade Austria, Anschluss. And what could you do? And then we might take Sudetenland from Czechoslovakia and Czechoslovakia collapses. And what could you do about it? Or uh, fascist Italy, Mussolini invades uh, Ethiopia uses their poison gas, and what could you do? So it was a situation pretty much like today internationally, a situation of collapsing international order, situation when uh, it's very difficult to find the West, or actually Russia, speaking with one voice. And this is when, uh, in this collapsing international order, violent things begin happening in the periphery. However, just like back at the beginning of 20th century and in the 1930s, it's very dangerous. It's dangerous not only for Armenia, it's dangerous for the whole region because as I said, Azerbaijan or Ilham Aliyev invited jihadis and invited Turkish assistance. How is he going to get them out? Will they ever leave? What will become of his own power base? So sometimes it's frightening watching him simply because uh, he sacrificed his long-term survival, political survival, for the sake of short-term gain. He's hoping to gain massively. If he gets back all the districts of uh, Karabakh, not only Azerbaijani, but uh, Armenian Karabakh itself, 
he will be the great warrior probably. Uh, he will drum up his uh, victory. This doesn't, this looks less likely with every day. Why? Because Armenian battle front is still holding. Blitzkrieg, which lasts a month, is no longer Blitzkrieg. It's war of attrition. Armenians are bleeding, but apparently Azerbaijani forces are also bleeding terribly. And this might be the reason why there is no um, observance of ceasefire. Armenians are very much interested in ceasefire at this point. And I think if Armenian uh, political elites survive more or less intact, they should be able to negotiate uh, some kind of compromise because compromise is, is uh, inevitable and very much necessary here. However, it looks less and less likely that Azerbaijan can afford to negotiate a compromise. That's why they leave to rot the dead bodies of their soldiers in the front lines and don't allow Red Cross to remove them. Because as long as they are lying dead and decaying somewhere in the fields, they can be denied as being dead. You know, only when the dead decomposing bodies are brought by closed caskets for burial back home, the real extent of what is going on will become known. It will be impossible to hide. Uh, in Azerbaijan, the mass media are very much controlled. And by the way, you know, the, all these uh, social media uh, are either banned or again, very, uh, very controlled. So this is more like Saddam Hussein's regime now, if not North Korea. Uh, but in the longer term, you know, Azerbaijan and Turkey face international isolation. They have created too much of trouble to hope for uh, not even alliance, any sympathy or lenience you know, from Western Europe, from the United States, and least, uh, least of all from Russia. So this is why they un very unrealistically insist that Turkey, which basically is driving this war, should become a peacemaker. Very improbable, very far-fetched, but this is the way of stalling negotiations, failing twice now the ceasefire negotiated in Moscow, which in itself is very interesting. Why would they sign on ceasefire proposed by Putin, probably because Putin is a very forceful figure. But why would they fail Putin? And what do they expect from that? So let me conclude by saying two more things. First, that uh, this war has only two solutions. Complete defeat for Armenia, which is not very likely, or a uh, negotiated solution, which is also very unlikely, given what I just explained about the options of Azerbaijan, which is an in international isolation. What could we do about it? First of all, I would urge all Armenians listening to me now, please get out of social media, get real. We need more people not waving flags and not posting something on the internet, which is pretty useless, but rather preparing to help the families, grieving families of the soldiers who are dead, who are being brought for burial. Helping even more those who are wounded. They will need a lot of help in the coming days. Helping the refugees. And let me remind you, it's still the COVID pandemic going on. Helping the victims. We have a lot of problems. It is going to be a struggle in the long run I cannot promise you any uh, solution anytime soon. Uh, it will be necessary to sustain the Republic of Armenia itself. It is in, it's a small state, it's in a difficult situation. It needs to survive. Uh, it will be very important to maintain uh, diplomatic operations, but this I leave to the government of Armenia. I'm not even citizen of, I live in Armenia, but I'm not citizen of Armenia. So this is not exactly my business. But I hope that Mr. Nikol Pashinyan, who is now the head of Armenian state, uh, will be learning quickly and learning, you know, he has good examples to emulate, like the president of Armenia, who's a fairly nominal figure. Armen Sarkisyan is a wonderful diplomat. You know, whatever you might think, you know, he's a wonderful diplomat. Uh, I hope that Armenia would be able to consolidate internally. And I see actually as a sociologist science of uh, such social consolidation. 
And let me finish uh, my presentation on my personal dilemma. In a few days from now comes my birthday. Should I celebrate? And I thought that I should. Because this is difficult times, this is a dark hour, we must celebrate. Every time I go through the bazaar in Yerevan, I buy flowers to my wife, for my wife. Why? Because it makes her smile. Think about it. I buy toys for the children of my friends. You know, my own children are quite adult at this point. I insist that we must try to maintain life as normal and human as possible. So I will, I'm going to celebrate in a very small company, probably myself and my wife, but we will cook something good and tasty. And I will raise the first shot of Tutti Ari of Karabakhce Mulberry Brandy in silence to those who fell defending. I will drink the second toast, very small shot, raising it high to those who are still defending. And the third to their mothers, because they're heroes. As to me, we will drink to myself when it's over. I hope it will be over in a year. But now, steal your heart, organize, and realize you know, that this is a battle for survival. This is a battle for democracy, democracy in Armenia and democracy in post-Soviet space. And this is actually a battle to prevent international terrorism. I never thought I would be saying this. I said many good things about Azerbaijan. I respect Azerbaijani people. I respect Azerbaijani culture. I remind you that this, is, this country was able of producing such writers as Akram Ailis Lee, the author of Stone Dreams. I very highly recommend reading this or rereading this novel. But at the same time, Azerbaijan under the leadership of Ilham Aliyev is turning both into a satellite of very aggressive uh, Turkey and a hub of international terrorism. This must be stopped. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor. Um, I can't thank you enough uh, for such uh, in-depth, but it's at the same time condensed and uh, humanly heartfelt um, presentation. Um, we do have quite a lot of questions uh, coming in, um, and I will try to go through as much as I can. We, um, I think our um, listeners uh, would stay with us. Uh, we will go um, beyond one hour uh, because the topic is so vast and it's such a unique opportunity. Um, th there are two questions coming from the UK uh, and I would like to uh, focus on, on them for a few minutes. And they, um, it's from Tim Wilson and Veronica Grant. Um, the questions are, to do with the armed sales and high-tech and explosive armaments manufactured and sold by Western governments to many uh, territories and the conflicts um, uh, outside Western Europe. Uh, do you see this government, what is your stand, uh, as a complicit in this con conflict, or is it more a promote peace or promotes hostility? And since we're talking that we, uh, about the, the, the arms sales, which is not the new subject, obviously, um, could we also touch on, on the role of the BP in the modern Azerbaijan? You talked about uh, the um, oil um, rich economies uh, from the 19th century, but what we know today that BP holds uh, an operational control of 80% of Azerbaijani oil production and 90% of uh, its oil exports. And BP invested about $75 billion over 25 years in the Azerbaijani economy. And that's where the budget the, that to buy arms come from, uh, mostly. Can we speak about that? Uh, th thank you, Nuna. Uh, please do read the questions and, and group them, you know, because I'm afraid I, uh, I will have difficulty reading from, from the screen in small print. Um, uh, also, let me address the audience uh, that as professor, you know, the class is over, you know, so you can leave at any moment of your convenience and don't feel bad about it. Um, 
<clears throat> but it is my honor to stay and it is my duty actually you know, to stay and answer the questions. Okay, now let's look as conscientious citizen at what is going on with arms sales. These are important, unfortunately, these are very important industries for many countries, for not many, but a few, and the number is growing of those who are manufacturing sophisticated weapons. Um, in fact, this war would not become possible. It would not start, I'm quite convinced, with conventional weapons. This war is something new in the arsenal because on the one side is the Armenian army, which had mostly defensive anti-aerial weapons, artillery, you know, so holding the uh, attackers at bay. And uh, Azerbaijan was deterred. So if you speak about de weapons as deterrence, yeah, you know, there was a deterrence working for about 27 years. However, the appearance of uh, Israeli weapons and uh, Turkish weapons, uh, sophi new sophisticated drones, guided missiles, changed the balance. And that's why Azerbaijan tried you know, to score a quick victory. And now victory in the war of attrition because they can have complete domination in the air thanks to swarms of drones. Uh, this is, by the way, you know, kind of war which uh, we haven't seen yet. However, let me remind you, you know, that uh, it's not very profitable. Of course, you know that, yeah, weapons are bought and sold for huge sums of money. We are speaking about millions and billions of dollars. This is profitable. But I doubt that this is the reason alone. Unfortunately, this is also part of uh, geopolitical calculations. Those tend to go awry. Remember, you know, that first of all, Turkey was a loyal, once a loyal member of the NATO alliance. It is still there. Uh, by the way, there is no expulsion from NATO. You know, so Turkey has been there since the Second World War because it was a very important staging ground against the Soviet Union. Uh, the air base in Injerlik, which is in Turkey, uh, was a major and remains a major uh, United States uh, basing ground in the Middle East. Uh, there are rumors about moving it, you know, because there are misgivings about the uh, hyperactive, very provocative foreign policies of Mr. Erdogan. But it's very difficult uh, because there are some costs, you know, so to move a whole air base and actually to ruin the alliance. So I think you know, Israelis, of course, were much more interested in Azerbaijan's airfields in case they were going to bomb Iran. And I want to remind you, it's very important you know, not to confuse the governments of Israel. I, I speak in plural, you know, because in Israel, governments tend to change quite quickly. Uh, then Mr. Netanyahu himself, who is in charge of one after another of these governments, and someone's calculation, you know, that, okay, great, Israel got on its side, yet another Muslim state. Azerbaijan is not very much Muslim state. Azerbaijan is uh, post-Soviet. But, uh, of course, you know, it borders on Iran. And this is what uh, probably was the main calculation of uh, at least some people in Israeli security establishment. But then there are the common Israelis. And you know that there are quite a few people who feel ashamed that the nation which itself had uh, survived horrible Holocaust in 20th century might be siding with uh, Turkey or with Turkish regime, you know, which was the perpetrator of the first genocide of 20th century or the inheritor of those perpetrators and trying to resume it again. So I would ask everyone, you know, to be very careful in distinguishing, you know, that this is not the Jewish people Oh, this is not the Western or French or American or Canadian peoples. These are not even the politicians, you know, all politicians. You know, there are some politicians and the uh, pressure on them must be very targeted. So we need actually people who think clearly about political campaigning, uh, people who know how political uh, systems in democracies and Israel and the West are democracies, how they function, what would work, what would be too disruptive. 
you know, just waving a flag in the middle of uh, Los Angeles Avenue during rush hour might not really win many hearts on your side. So, uh, however, you know, demonstrating uh, in front of certain businesses which are supplying very important parts for the drones manufactured in Turkey might be more effective. And the same applies to British Petroleum. BP is a business. It's not a charity and it's not a government. It's a business, it's profit oriented. However, the profits are always uh, balanced by costs and moral cost, moral hazard in this case, could be also a very important cost. And I want probably some people to remind uh, BP, you know, that they might be running now this risk. Not to mention, by the way, you know, that uh, it's apparently pretty expensive oil in the Caspian. It's pretty difficult to transport it. So there are actually, I need to mention it earlier, you know, additional economic reasons for both Mr. Aliyev before he faces actually ruin due to the declining oil prices. And for Mr. Erdogan, because just look at the Moody's, you know, the Moody's International Ratings uh, Agency, look at their reports and warnings about Turkish economy. So this is probably additional very important factor and there civil societies and peace campaigning could make a difference, I hope. Thank you. Thank you very much. There is a very interesting question. Um, uh, I'm sorry, I'm not going to pronounce the names of people because I just don't want to offend anyone. Uh, people that come, uh, questions are coming from all over the world. Why do you keep calling Syrian mercenaries as jihadis? They're not there for holy war. They're fighting for money. Uh, that's a very good question. It's empirical question because I'm a sociologist. Um, I wish we could interview or survey those gentlemen. Uh, I actually did some of such surveying early in my life uh, in places like Chechnya. So let me tell you, you know, that money and ideology go together quite well, especially with jihadi ideology. Uh, so uh, for quite a few people in places like Syria and Iraq and Afghanistan, unfortunately, war became uh, a job, a way of life, but also an identity. So we hear that quite a few of those people used to fight against the Syrian regime first uh, under the banners of uh, Front al-Nusra or Jabhat al-Nusra. And there are different names, you know, they, they, are, uh, they are immaterial, frankly, you know, because there were so many. I once asked the United Nations uh, rapporteur on, on Syria, Lahdar Brahimi, you know, so what is the regime in Syria and what is their position? And he said, well, the regime is the mafia family, you know, so you know from the Godfather movie. Uh, the opposition said, I asked when I took my job with the United Nations, I asked the secretariat to give me a list of opposition group. When they reached number 674, I told them to stop. These are not political parties. These are neighborhood gangs or whatever, you know, tribal groups. And... Uh, uh, it's besides ideology, this was a way of, uh, jih for jihadists and of creating alliances, international alliances and finding international sponsorship. There they could be pretty promiscuous and that's why probably they changed their names. Uh, they're mercenaries, yes, but uh, I, I would not exclude ideological motivation because this is very important. But how do we know about it? We have very little way of knowing. You know, when we see more of them, and I hope, you know, some are captured alive, you know, we might uh, have some better proof. However, you know, we, you should pretty much, you know, just extrapolate, you know, from what you are watching in Syria, uh, in those enclaves like Afrin, and you understand, you know, so why are they being used and how they are themselves trying to use others. That's my answer. You know. So we can go at length, you know, but that should be enough. Thank you. I have another question for you. And thank you for saying uh, get off the social media, uh, because I think this is uh, a very, it's a strong and a, and a very powerful message. Uh, um, but um, there is a question about how do you, uh, how do you describe and what is in your view, the international media coverage uh, of the conflict today? 
And um, is it skewed? Uh, is it biased uh, in any way or in your My view? opinion, it is rather distracted. There are also certain biases uh, in Russia, for instance, and you know, there are quite a few, um, I would say Russian nationalists who are uh, in combative spirits because they see immediately, of course, I'm, well, I, I, th I think many other Russians, uh, including at the very top, see the, the threat to Russian influence. In a very, for Russia, it's a very strategically important region in the world. Uh, it might be for this reason, you know, that Russian liberal opposition media are trying to stay very, very neutral or uh, project the image uh, of equidistance, you know, that Armenian Azerbaijan traded accusations. Give me a break. Uh, actually, Azerbaijani accusations have, if you have the gut or the nose, you know, to withhold that smell, because sometimes I'm a professional, I have to look at uh, those sites, you know, and they stink, uh, frankly, you know, but you uh, can predict actually some uh, action uh, by going in reverse. Uh, what's the bias, you know, if um, Azerbaijani official media accuse Armenia of bringing mercenaries, this means that they are bringing them themselves. If they accuse Armenia of bombarding uh, peaceful uh, areas, you know, uh, civilians, uh, Stepana cared beware, and so forth. You know, so uh, when, they, when they say, you know, that they want negotiation, this means, you know, that they will proceed with war. And uh, this is very Orwellian in that sense. For the rest of the world, it's actually quite distant and there are many problems. And that was, I think, you know, must be a calculation of Mr. Erdogan, that there is COVID pandemic, but there is even bigger concern for many, you know, the, like uh, American elections. You know, what is going to happen in the United States? Because this is, is a seminal, possibly very contested election, um, fraught, some Americans think, with regime change. Uh, so this is also, you know, the moment when uh, Karabakh seems so far away. Okay, just another thing, just another thing like somewhere in Africa, or in the Middle East, something is always happening there, something nasty, we know this, but as long as the refugees are not coming across European borders, um, maybe we can keep, and we, we quite, don't quite know, you know, uh, what is going on, but it takes time. There are journalists coming to the area, uh, there are uh, more and more reports, uh, reports emerging saying that, hey, wake up, you know, this is not going to end just with a border clash. Uh, and, well, you know, for instance, Thomas De Waal, you know, who a uh, prominent British journalist and analyst who maintained uh, very strict neutrality in this conflict for generations. And by the way, his uh, book, Black Garden, is quite recommended here. You know, I think, you know, this is the most thorough um, an unbiased exposition of the background to the conflict in English language today. You know, it is, I think, in the second or third um, uh, edition now. So it, it is recommended, but even um, Tom Deval now had to take a position, you know, because what is going on is, at the very least, ethnic cleansing. At most, you know, this is not going to end just with uh, Azerbaijan asserting its rights. And there we, we need to uh, do a lot of um, kind of wake up calls intelligently, again, not too disruptively, but intelligent, intelligently explaining you know, to people that this is much more fraught situation than you think. You know, it, it, much, it would be much better to intervene now than later I think the people at the top positions in the West, they're very much aware. The problem for them is actually selling it to their own populations you know, who, are, who are facing economic crisis uh, caused by COVID pandemic of unheard of proportions. You know? uh, it's like Great Depression. You know? So the winter and the next year are going to be very challenging for many countries. And we are adding to concerns. We have to be polite about it. We have to understand, you know, that people are already overwhelmed. But uh, by the way, at the same time, I want to uh, express my confidence, you know, that there are not, not only uh, West European or American actors, 
for instance, the United Arab Emirates might be very displeased, you know, with the expansion of this regime because there are quite a few countries which are concerned with the spread of terrorism. And that might include even China. So we need a lot of diplomacy, but uh, how should I say? Do not assume that if you don't read it in the newspapers, nothing is happening. Probably a lot is happening behind closed doors or on closed telephone lines or in personal interaction. I think much of what is going on by now, almost a month later, is quite clear to any professional observer. It's quite clear what are the prospects I just tried to describe to you. And that's why, please, don't waste your time in social media explaining to each other, preaching to the chorus, what everyone knows already. Please try to think, how could I make a difference? How could I be more productive in this? And it's probably not necessarily in um, drawing media attention. There are people who are professionally doing this, and I trust they're successful. Um, thank you. There are a number of questions which I would group uh, as an internal politics questions. Uh, there are some uh, heartfelt messages here. Uh, um, do you think it's fair and just uh, to call the young people uh, to die uh, for the nation at this stage? I will add to that how far will this war, how far will this war affect uh, uh, Prime Minister Pashinyan and perhaps uh, the all, all the former prime ministers uh, and presidents of Armenia and Azerbaijan and Artsakh, who actually stand alongside uh, Prime Minister Pashinyan uh, right now in um, the public domain. And there's also a question: How does this war? What are the social perspectives and threats this war poses to Armenia post uh, 2018? democratic transition. So it's a whole bulk of uh, questions dealing with internal politics, if you could say a few words, how you see that. Um, well, previously, no, no, I told you, you know, that I met Mr. Pashinyan only once by chance, and it was years ago before he became prime minister. I am not privy you know, to what is going on, uh, but this is probably my advantage. I'm a cabinet scholar in this case. Uh, so I observe from outside and I'm trying you know, to give you an exam example, you know, how to observe, how to piece together the picture from what is being said and what probably is not being said. So first of all, the ethical issue you know, uh, of pacifism. Is it moral to call young to die? Well, ask the young people, but I think this is uh, very much the uh, kind of a question that stood between World War I and World War II. World War I, yes, there was very warranted pacifism. World War II, do you have to stand up to Nazis? When and how would that end? Was the Holocaust preventable? So at what point was it still preventable? Could Hitler, Mussolini, Japanese military, could they have been stopped earlier? And was it necessary to fight? These are very difficult questions because they involve human lives. However, the alternative is surrender. And I'm afraid, you know, the kind of surrender where you're not going to like the terms at all because there will be no, no end to the demand, you know. So once there is one surrender, there will be more others. So these are in many parts, you know, the what, what we see already in this global fight on terror, which was very misguided, uh, which was misconstrued on all sides and how to get out of it. Uh, now, uh, this is a vast, you know, a separate topic. So I was asked about the domestic politics. So what we had in Armenia, I wrote a whole book, which is in Russian and uh, part translated into Eastern Armenian, um, leaving the uh, post-Soviet regime in Armenia. So in Armenia, we had a very typical uh, evolution like in other post-Soviet countries. We got a kind of a soft variety of authoritarianism mostly, you know, any mayor of Chicago, you know, I lived in Chicago for 14 years. I can tell you, you know, that any mayor of Chicago would have 
immediately recognized what he was seeing, you know, kind of electoral machine, as we called it in Chicago. Right? You know, corrupt electoral machine delivering the necessary results with population resigning to selling their vote or thinking you know, that their vote doesn't matter. I want to remind you, you know, that those were the regimes which squandered the opportunities to for more peaceful settlement, possibly, I'm not sure, that Haidar Ali would have signed. Uh, but second, you know, and this is the accusation that might stick, they might have prepared their defenses better. Uh, Nikol Pashinyan is a novice in politics. You know, he comes, as you realize, you know, from uh, a position uh, from the same kind of you know, social media journalism, and quite often he he speaks up his mind, and sometimes he goes over the board too much. You know, for a statesman, it's very difficult, you know, to transition, you know, from uh, a position to statesmanship. But I hope that we will see a more consolidated regime. Why? You know, because any defeat, uh, defeat always destroys regimes. Victory always strengthens regimes. So this might, by, uh, by the way, you know, this might be uh, a concern for the former presidents that Nikol Pashinyan, if um, he emerges more or less victorious, it's too early to say. You know what would be what would might victory look like here it will be still some some kind of compromise you know but he would be strengthened and as you know you know that he was very much intent on prosecuting them uh personally well personal professional as a sociologist i do not think that anti-corruption campaigns in the wake of democratization are really that successful uh, look at the attempts at lustration in Poland, Hungary, and many other countries. So I don't think you know, it was number one uh, priority, but this is not the time to attack Nikol Pashinyan's regime. For Ar to Armenians, I want to remind you know, that the war in Karabakh in the early 1990s was largely helped by the, the Armenian victory in that war was helped by this political instability in Azerbaijan. Azerbaijan between 1991 and 94 went through, I think, three presidents, uh, Mutalibov, El Chibay, and Heydar Aliyev. God forbid something like this happens now in Armenia, then not only Pashinyan, you all lose. Right now, it is necessary to observe not only external ceasefire, but probably a domestic ceasefire in Armenian politics. I very much hope they all realize this because they are all in the same boat. They will not be spared if they are defeated. That's more than I could say. Thank you. I have a, a last question. We, um, I'm, I'm, I'm so grateful to all our listeners who stay with us, uh, and I could see the numbers uh, um, uh, are not declining. Um, um, there are two questions which are very similar, uh, one coming from Canada, um, uh, and it's about possible ways uh, and options for reconciliation. Uh, government to government, people to people, should the international community be involved? UN, EU, Red Cross, in your view. Uh, and there is another question which is resonating with this one. Do you think that the international institutions would change in some way coming out of this particular crisis in the way they deal in, you know, with the com war conflicts uh, and their practices? Because we all know that they're not highly effective, and you know this is not something new. Uh, the question is, why are they not highly effective? They were designed, actually, consciously, after World War One and especially after the Second World War, to be effective. The United Nations was designed in 1944 as almost a world government. It was supposed to have an international bank, World Bank, uh, IMF, so that the uh, sovereign governments would not be forced to borrow at very disadvantageous terms from private banks. It was supposed to have Ministry of Health, the World Health Organization, Ministry of Culture, UNESCO. So it was, uh, and it was supposed to have a world police, which is 
called the Security Council, calling on, well, there would be no United Nations uh, forces of its own, but it would uh, bring uh, the forces from its member states. This never worked because of Cold War, because the Soviet Union and the United States could never agree and all this jo joke, uh, joking for power going on. Uh, however, the idea is still there. I hope something emerges of it, you know, same with the European Union. But at this point, I actually see, uh, I must look realistically, you know, so what is happening? That uh, the situation very highly depends on um, cooperation between the governments, which otherwise are exchanging blows. That's the government of, of Russia, you know, the Vladimir Putin and his opponents in the West. I'm not going to, to list, you know, so what are the issues there, but the issues are right now emerging and the sanctions are being pursued. But at the same time, governments of France and who knows what is going to be within two weeks, the United States administration. All right, so these are, by the way, you know, France, Russia and the United States are the co-chairs uh, of the Minsk group on Karabakh conflict. And the uh, desire, you know, so st very strong desire of the Turkey and Azerbaijan to introduce Turkey as a co-chairman uh, tells you, you know, so what they fear. They fear a joint action, you know, by three important powers. And then of course, you know, many others would join in. Uh, that would be probably quite a universal opinion. That would also please uh, probably Moscow, you know, because Moscow, which must be itching to interfere at this point, you know, because um, what, they are, what they are observing uh, must be very much to discredit and displeasure of Russia. Uh, but they would probably like to act with um, support of their Western counterparts. So we have to watch you know, for that. Now, government to government, uh, peaceful resolution, I explained, I think already at some length, you know, that uh, for governments in part in Armenia, but in Armenia, it's actually easier because it's a chaotic, but it's still a democracy. In Azerbaijan, it's probably out of the question, you know, any reconciliation you know, at the government level, you know, because that is a kind of a regime which needs to project brutal force because it's a sultanistic regime. Otherwise, it's very difficult to retire from such a regime. It's very difficult to imagine uh, what happens to, uh, what good happens to Ilham Aliyev in 10 years. So he will need to project this uh, armed machism and extreme nationalism because the rulers of his type, they just disappear or they go into exile if they're lucky. You know, they don't go into retirement very rarely. Uh, people to people, yes, I place some hope in it, you know, but you must also realize, you know, that Azerbaijani national psyche is um, traumatized. They lost a war in the past. Uh, they often feel that few countries or few people outside like them. Uh, so we will need actually, you know, to keep on reminding, you know, that they actually had people like Akram Ailis Lee. A great writer. Uh, they had Nizami Ganjevi. And by the way, you know, the first great poem of Azerbaijani literature by Nizami Ganjevi, Hosrov and Shirin, is about the love of Persian uh, prince Hosrov to an Armenian princess, Shirin. She was from Barda, from Partev, uh, and she was Christian. She was, she was either Armenian, well, uh, maybe Assyrian. Uh, so there are uh, very important reasons uh, to be reminded of such things. And by the way, you know, personally, I have quite a few Azerbaijani friends uh, since my days in Moscow. You know, when I studied at Moscow State University, uh, I maintain connections. I try to do my best. I think that might work, you know, but the problem is that people to people doesn't quite work in authoritarian regimes. You know, because some of my friends who are in Azerbaijan years ago, ask me, please, God forbid, don't write me a message. You know, don't send me anything because everything here is being read. So I try not to jeopardize their lives. 
But actually, I keep, you know, uh, just above this desk here is a beautiful plate given to me and my wife on our wedding by an Azerbaijani friend who is a prominent scholar. I wouldn't say more because he's there. Right. And what else I told you, you know, that what else, you know, once there is security and there is some kind of exchange, because those districts of Azerbaijan, which Armenians occupied as buffer zone, they do belong in Azerbaijan. Uh, this is my opinion alone. However, you know, they were always uh, promised you know, to be returned if security of Karabakh is assured. So this is the goal and the hope now. That's all I can say. Thank you very much, Professor. Uh, I wouldn't even try to sum up today's discussion uh, because there's been so many issues touched. Um, and I think now uh, our listeners um, would understand better why I've said in the beginning that sometimes listening to uh, Professor Lugian twice makes sense because there's been so many issues uh, uncovered and touched upon and they're so interconnected. Uh, obviously, out of the two scenarios that you're giving, I think no human being of free will um, would, you know, prefer the, the first one. Okay, and every war at some point ends um, because there's no wars that go on forever. So, and I think it's very important that we keep true to the past, we tr keep true to academic knowledge, use our knowledge rigidly, don't read Facebook and avoid uh, the brainwashing and the propaganda and listen to people like Professor Delugan and thank you very much. Um, and I'm sorry we haven't answered all the questions, but at least I think we've touched upon major issues that our um, listeners uh, were concerned about. Um, thank you very much again. And I will, I will call you on your birthday and I will toast uh, to you and thank you for everything that you're doing for us. Good night. Good night.